In this week's episode, I am featuring a recording where I appeared as a guest on another podcast. This one from Corey Falter's show, In Sync, spelled I-N-N-S-Y-N-C. Corey is a partner at Lore Agency, a hospitality B2B sales and marketing agency. But my advice cuts across all niches. How a poorly optimized website can significantly impact a company's bottom line. So from understanding the importance of persuasive copy to implementing the right frameworks and building trust, I provide actionable insights that every business owner and B2B marketer needs to hear. So tune in to discover how to turn your website into a conversion machine, attract the right clients, and ultimately boost your revenue. Let's get into it. All right, Linda, thanks for joining me on the NSYNC show. How are you doing? Good. How are you, Corey? It's been a while since we chatted on here. It has been a while. I think you were one of the top five shares when I first got this little thing rolling here. So I'm excited to have you back. And I've got Linda Malone and it, she is at The Copy Works. I'm so excited because we are going to tap into another huge misunderstanding that many hospitality vendors have regarding the impact of a poorly optimized website has on their numbers. So what is a conversion optimized website anyways, Linda? It's exactly what it sounds. When you think of conversion, it's something that you want, you want people to take action. So the action ultimately will hopefully be a sale. But before you get there, your copy on your website has to include a lot of different things in order to get people to that point. So the number one thing that I do is what's called persuasive copy. And so that takes a lot of knowledge of how people think, how they make decisions, not to be confused with manipulation, because a lot of times people say, oh, psychology, you're trying to manipulate people into buying. That's not it at all. It's about meeting people where they are in their decision-making process. What is it that they're looking for? You've heard the saying, like, you want to pick up with the conversation they're already having in their heads. Like, why would they land on your site? What are they doing or what are they being challenged by that makes them seek a solution. So a lot of it is the copy that addresses their specific pain points. That's probably the biggest thing. And the calls to action have to be specific as well. We throw copy up on buttons that will just click here or sign up without really thinking. And that's called micro copy. And in copywriting, conversion copywriting especially, that's where you really need to think about what the copy is that you, what do you want that person to do? And are you asking them to do something too early, which I see on a lot of sites. Like for example, a button that says sign up when it's on the header and people don't even know what you offer yet. And a lot of times they'll click it just out of habit. Oh, what is this? And then they land on a sales page and they say, you know what, I'm not ready for this and they're gone. So those sorts of things, you have to really look at every single word. And this is also, I just recently had my own website redesigned. It also has to do with the design of the site, of course, but the copy, which is my thing, of course, is is all about that. Getting them to know that you understand what they are going through and you have a solution and here's what you can do and here's some action you can take. You and I have worked on a couple of very successful projects together. I want to talk about with you a little bit more drill down is your problem agitate solution framework right on the homepage and the importance of the hook of addressing that right up front. So maybe you can expand a little bit more on why that is so important with B2B and not necessarily a B2C or something of a more of a sizzle website that you would normally see with a, say a hotel that's visually emotionally driven. There's a lot of pushback. It's funny because I just did a newsletter for my own subscribers on exactly this subject because there's a lot of debate. Do you start with the problem or do you start with the solution? And I found that E There's an argument for each of them, but the one that's slightly higher is starting with the problem. And the reason is people are searching there. They have a problem. They start looking for a solution. Then they forget why they're even looking or they'll that's land on a couple right. websites and think it's not really that bad. I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Right. Because the easiest thing, the biggest obstacle you're going to be up against is the status quo. Why should I make a change? It's because change is really hard and people are afraid of doing that. So the compromise, which I see on a lot of sites, is to have the pain point, but worded in a way that kind of weaves in the solution at the same time, which ends up being like your value proposition. 
or you can do the value prop, which is what differentiates you. And then under it, the tagline is like the problem is right there. But you have to let them know that you understand what they're going through. And it's got to be about them, not about you right up front. So that's approach it. It's a yeah. common as you mentioned before, that personal impact, like when they immediately go to that homepage and they go, that's me, that's what I'm struggling with. And I used this analogy yesterday in my conversation is twisting the knife. <laughs> I <have> great <laughs> visual. <laughs> it sounds a little gruesome. It's, it's that personal impact. And the more that you twist, the more that they can feel the pain right up front. And it's meant to hook them in and go, wow, that is interesting. I need to learn more because the further you get them down that page, the further down the funnel, and then that next section that you beautifully wrote is what the industry norm is and what they struggle with. And right below that is that payoff and immediately having right. those three steps. I do that approach though of the value proper, at least in the hero section, those two complementing each other. Obviously on our next project, maybe we can explore that a little bit further. Great breakdown. And then my second part in it gets back to exactly what Sam Dunning and I were talking about on my last podcast this month is the concept of EAT, right? Experience, expertise, trust, and authority. I'm assuming those are extremely important elements of the website as well. Yeah, the biggest thing I think is building that trust, Big talk. especially now with all the AI and people are, everyone's starting to sound like, everyone's already been sounding like everyone else. And now it's even worse Big time. because the words are the same. The phrasing is the same. I recently worked with a client where I took their podcast and plugged it into, there's a lot of sites you can get on now that say, is this AI generated or is it human? I plugged it in. Every single thing was a hundred percent AI. Wow. If it's obvious and it's not just them, I've seen it on a lot of sites. You, you, I think you probably recognize it now. They're always using the same words. And if, it's just as soon as I say that, I know it's like, all right, you're not differentiating yourself. You're only hurting yourself. Is it easy? Sure. Just plug and play. Oh, we'll just get AI to write this. But especially in the hospitality industry, you it's a people business. And whether it's B2B or B2C, B2C informs B2B. So you need to know what your customers want so that you can address those on a different level. And if you don't know what their challenges are, you know, from there, it's a starting point. How are you going to create a messaging that impacts like uh, you on a B2B level that it enables you to get customers on the B2B level? So, yeah, I think it's most important to really differentiate yourself and find what makes you different. This goes for any niche, but especially with the hospitality, because there's so much that is the same. And I think people right. are afraid of sounding different. They oh, Absolutely. And that's part of the, this industry has a lot of, they, as you mentioned before, change is hard. Oftentimes they, we don't want to make change unless the pain of not making change is more than what the, the change can occur. And a lot of businesses have not done a great job. I think of underscoring the pain of not making change. And so what happens is they wait for a big shift primarily at the brands or some other level to make that. And then they all turn and they run in that direction. It's like going to the trade show. This industry is obsessed with tra in, in person trade shows. They wait behind the scenes and then they all flood to the trade shows and every you go to the booths and it's overload and it's all feature dumping. It's hard really to figure out exactly what's going on. The landscape is so difficult to navigate. You need to differentiate yourself and, and position yourself as the only solution for a very acute pain that you have and not using terminology like ele elevating the guest experience or we're, we're going to revolutionize hospitality. That, right. Those are very common terms in the industry. No one cares. Yeah. No. And it doesn't mean anything. It's it a generalization. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think yeah. it's so important that your product or service in B2B immediately differentiates that or isolates that problem and then you address that and help build like we talked about trust which is the uh platinum level of service moving forward in business because if you don't have trust you don't have business you don't no. have to be liked in business that's a nice to have but trust is a non-negotiable you don't have trust you got nothing and i think the other thing to keep in mind is a lot of times people will say 
were really not that different or they really struggled to find what differentiates them. You don't have to necessarily find what makes you different, although that would be ideal. You need to find what no one else is talking about. Like everyone could be doing the same thing, but no one else is talking about it because especially when you're in the business and you think, why would I say this? Because our competitors do the same thing, but are they talking about it? Are they playing it up? The whole beer, uh, was it Schlitz, that marketing story back, way back when, I forget who it was. I'm always messing up the, the original copywriter, but it was, I want to say John Caples, but I don't think it was. I think it was Eugene Schwartz, who was hired by Schlitz to increase their revenues. What he did is he went to all the beer making factories and he found that they were cleaning their bottles in such a way, sterilizing them and some kind of sterilization process that he was really impressed by and he said this is awesome what do you you know when he asked him to explain it to him and the clients all of our everyone does this he goes but no one's talking about it Uh he made that the focal point of their messaging and it schlicked into being like the number one beer like their their sales skyrocketed only because he talked about if you're in the industry and this is an everyday thing for us not to people who aren't in the industry so find what is it that no one's talking about and it could be that personal service. Everyone does it. Yeah, but how much are they talking about it? And right. where is it on their website? And, yeah. and most importantly, what's the impact? What's the outcome of personalized service? That's part of the problem is they're leading with the front end and not the outcome. Because at the end of the day, which is our next question, is revenue. When you boil it all down and it's the features and the apps and that, ultimately it's about profitability and revenue. That, so right. that could be the end goal. Which is a great segue into my next question, by the way. You, you like how I did that? I'm, getting back, on, I'm getting back <laughs> on my game here, Linda. Everybody wants to know what the impact is having on, say, a poorly optimized website is having on their bottom line. So maybe you can share that with us. When I do research on these sorts of stats, there's so many different factors. In general, not only do you have the increased sales, but you also have from a fully optimized website is lower customer acquisition costs. They're getting more bang, like for ads, for example, ads and promotions, you get better results because when they get to your site, especially when, say for example, there's an ad on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, and they already know about your product or service and they know they want it. So they come to your site, but yet in order to get to the page where they can take action, they have to go through and figure out where it is. That's a poorly optimized site. You don't even know how much you're losing. Now, I had somebody on my own site. What made me change my own site was because somebody said I tried to to order something. It was a uh, audit on a website audit and your links didn't work. And I lost that business. And it's, I don't know how many people have done that where I wouldn't know. So a lot of it is you don't even know. Part of it is the website, the structure, the formatting. It should be fast, obviously, and smooth. But the whole idea of having copy that's optimized is to meet them where they are. So... Your homepage is going to collect everyone. They can be coming from a search engine. They come, could be coming from an ad. It's the hardest page to write because you have to hit all those different levels of awareness. And so a landing page would be ideal and more appropriate for an ad. So you place an ad and you make sure the link doesn't go to your homepage, but it goes to a landing page that specifically talks about what they just, the ad they just left. So that they're not confused. Okay, here's a solution. Yeah, I'm going to you know, book a call or whatever it is. So it's better customer retention, just overall value, and just the improved brand perception. They're going to have a better feel if they go to your site and it's not working right or something's confusing. They're not going to tell you. They're not going to email you and say, hey, your site's confusing. We're just going to leave. And right. there's enough competition. So it's the bounce rates, reduces that. My post today was, I'm not sure if you saw it, but I did a video of the concept of 96% of what was sales is now marketing. Oh, okay. No, I didn't see it yet. And that's that notion of getting back to the ask you answer and that because of the pandemic and our buyer decisions, I do the same thing is we want to control the sales process now. I want to go online. I want to do my search. I want to educate myself. The website to do 96% of the sales process. So I feel comfortable and then reaching out to sales. A lot of hospitality companies have not figured this out yet. And it's frustrating them because they're trying to use pulled outreach to get in touch with their prospects when they themselves are, I don't want to hear from sales. I don't, Mm -hmm. I want to do that myself. And 
that is having an impact on the bottom line because the journey has changed so much. And the optimization of a website, they have not gotten that memo and they're still hiding pricing, not giving all the FAQs. Not, they've got a thin website that does not include video or blog articles. Getting back to that AI comment that we had. Everything on it, it needs that's going to ask all my questions. So then I feel comfortable in reaching out to sales on my accord, which is that 4%. Right. That is a dramatic change in how B2B companies operate. That's huge. It's huge. And I, I know myself, I think one of the exceptions to that, though, would be when you want support, you don't want to deal with automation. I had been struggling or just before this call. So I had a problem with Zoom. I get on the chat, hoping there's going to be an actual person. But of course not. I have options. None of them fit. The thing it was the problem it was telling me I had was not on that list. So then what do you do? I can't talk to a person. I have four minutes to get on this call with you. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So you have to know there's a balance, especially when it comes, like I said, to hospitality. You want people that can talk to you that are not reading from a script too, that they, they can actually help you. But everything else, people will do their research, especially with AI out there. You can easily just say, hey, I'm comparing, because I do this all the time. I'm comparing right. all these options. In fact, you can have them put them in a table. Just put, tell me what the pros and cons for all these websites are for the services. And it'll tell you. And so people are doing that. So then they call you. Yeah. And that's another great incentive that I keep mentioning to people. You can't hide anything anymore. So do you, would you rather your prospects do their own fact finding and you're not leading that charge right or wrong, right? If they ask for a price on the copy works and what does Linda charge to rewrite an entire website and it's not, they can't find it anywhere. So they're using Chad GPT and suddenly it's not right, but it, you're the one that should be leading that charge. So right. the, the notion is you need to be forthright and transparent with all the information they need to make an informed decision. And if you're not, they're going to get it from some other place and that could right. be. Right. And that is the worst thing is to have the incorrect information. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And even, and I just listened to a podcast the other day about this, is that even if your pricing is, because especially with B2B, a lot of times it's custom. A lot of my projects are custom, most of them. Sure. But I have a few products to give you an idea of what I charge. So there's like a, an email sequence, there is a homepage audit and these things. So you can get on there and say, okay, she's in my price range or she's not. And this saves everyone a lot of time. So you can say with B2B starting it. Exactly. I just responded to a comment on my post and he had mentioned the concept of transparent pricing is great, but we've got very com confusing configurations and things. All I was mentioning is ballparking or starting from at least being open and honest about the discussion on your website. Because if you don't, when you click get price and it says contact sales, I immediately think there's something fishy going on and I leave. Right. Because any company that is not open and transparent these days, I immediately connect that with these guys are not honest and open. Or they're going to try to manipulate. You. Exactly. And I don't <laughs> want to go through that. I bounce. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to talk to people in general. <laughs> and we're not the, the stereotypical Zoomers or millennials. We're the we're from the other side of the fence, which we, you know, was pre-electronic. But I still want to control that process. I use this example of the Chipotle. Chipotle mm -hmm. gives me the option. Of, I've got the app or I can walk in and, and walk through the line of food. But oftentimes I'll stand in front of the store and I'll order it on the app and just pick it up because I don't want the experience of the line. But they're giving me options. I can right. that process. They're not forcing me down a path I don't want to go. And I feel that's a lot, oftentimes that's a lot of ways that B2B hospitality companies are taking in that what I just mentioned before, they're just hiding a lot of things that they should be open and honest with their information. And that mm -hmm. stops trust cold. And that's, that's what an, a, a fully optimized website should be providing. What are some top tips that you could provide us that maybe have a change of heart here on their website? The first thing is what I mentioned before is to really focus on your value proposition. What is it that makes you different or what is it that you do that maybe your competitors do, but no one's talking about? That is so huge because people will be shopping 
around and what they want is something that is unique. And if everyone sounds alike, then all you're going to do is compete on price or something else that you don't want to compete on. So that's number one is fine. What is your value proposition? And the way you find it is you talk to your customers, you talk to past customers. You you have to really dig in to find out and look at your analytics, take surveys. It's not a quick pro. It's not people sitting around a boardroom throwing ideas out. Now you really want to get that research. So it should be research oriented. The second thing is to really focus on that hero section mm. of your website. Because a lot of times, like 80% of people don't get past that. That's don't yeah. have something like welcome or, or the, just the name of the company, which I don't see too often, but sometimes I still do. That's a wasted real estate. So make sure that is optimized. And uh, even though video is a big thing, I'm and this is a personal thing because I'm on the fence about using video for that section because it's distracting. Right. If you want people to really look at your messaging, you have to wait. And it's always about testing, right? So that's the whole thing. So the, the hero section, finding your value proposition and rethinking your button copy. It sounds like a little thing, but that is literally the point of conversion. When people click on that button, they want to know what's on the other side of that door. It's like a little door. What am I going to find? Is it the other thing is to word it in a, like as if they are saying it, like I want to, right. and then you finish that sentence on the button. I want to talk to someone, whatever it is that you are talking about prior to that button. But don't just throw anything on it because people will react differently. And you can have different buttons on your website. So you can have maybe three different buttons all leading to the same contact page or whatever, but having it worded different. So you can mm -hmm. see what what is working for you too. That's so those are just three. Those are fantastic tips. And I'm going to add one in there. And it would be that third section, the importance of social proof, but video. You said you weren't quite sure about adding the video. I, I totally agree. But I think that third section, like we talked about in social proof, that third section being one to two minute video testimonial with the the goal being three, but at least having that one right up front and it's the challenges that they were facing, how the process went and what the outcome was. That framework in video from a past customer client is absolutely gold for hooking that prospect in. So I would add that fourth in there. So. I agree. Also because people can fake testimonials and people are not trusting them. They're not trusting them anymore. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, even the video element is getting really interesting. But luckily, like you said, there's there are some tools out there to really determine if it's AI generated or not. Thank God. Or you and I might be uh, looking for new jobs, by the way. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody asked, I think it was on Reddit, what's the scariest thing that you, what are you most afraid of? I think, I forget how exactly it was worded. But somebody said being on a video call with someone and not knowing if that person is actually human. Why? And people are like, yeah, <laughs> you don't know. Yeah, great. I'm real. To say, Thankfully, yes. <laughs> and ironically, as humans, we're becoming more aware of it and we don't like what we see. And it gets back to that whole thing of trust. Trust mm -hmm. is going to be the most important thing that a business can have. Because it, as that adage is, trust takes years to build. That's why cold outreach isn't working. Years to build and literally minutes to destroy. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. part of this in its accelerating is because of AI. And as soon as you damage your reputation by saying, I'm this, but you're not, and you're using this and, and people figure it out, you are done. And I, I tell people, please be very responsible some of these tools are really great. They're very powerful. We use a lot in taking a lot of data and cons consolidating down to some great peaks. It definitely has its uses, but replicating a human connection with AI is a, a recipe for disaster. You're, you, we don't want that. And your prospects don't want that. So don't, please don't do that. Yeah. So Linda, where are you and where can people find you, by the way? I'm on LinkedIn, of course. That's where we met. And my website is thecopyworks, W-O-R-X dot com. It's a brand new site, so I'd love to have people check it out. And you can poke around there. I have a blog that I'm starting to optimize. I had it for a while and didn't do anything with it, so I'll be doing more there. I have a newsletter, and that link is, it's I believe it's on 
It's on LinkedIn as well as on my website. You can get a, it comes out every Thursday. You can get it every week and it's exclusive information just for my subscribers. So if you're it's geared toward B2B marketers and copywriters. So I have a mix. Oh, an audience. Hey, I really appreciate it. As always, our conversations are awesome and on point. Appreciate you dropping some great insights and tidbits here. So I uh, look forward to our next conversation. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on, Corey. It's been you fun. Bet. Take care. Bye.